Charles Allen, who went by the infamous moniker Big Time Charlie, left a mark on the seedy underbelly of early 20th century Denver, Colorado. His arrival in 1916 marked the inception of one of the most sprawling and illicit prostitute enterprises the city had ever witnessed. Before his arrival in Denver, Charles Allen was a man of tall tales, having ventured into the Alaskan gold strikes and even riding alongside the legendary Pancho Villa in Mexico. However, upon his arrival in the Mile High City, he embarked on a path far removed from his adventurous past. Using a cunning blend of allure and deception, he ensnared women into the dark world of prostitution. What set his operation apart was his sinister practice of introducing young girls to the clutches of heroin and opium, ensnaring them in addictions before dispatching them to numerous cribs and bordellos. Shockingly, these women received compensation not in currency, but in the form of dangerous drugs. In a remarkably brief four-year period following his arrival, Charles Allen amassed an astonishing fortune, crossing the million-dollar threshold. Astonishingly, he siphoned off half of his wealth to appease Denver authorities, effectively buying their silence and complicity in his thriving prostitution empire. The city turned a blind eye to the dark underbelly until Big Time Charlie ventured into the wholesale distribution of narcotics, pushing the boundaries of tolerance to their limits. In 1919, the law finally caught up with Charles Allen. Authorities descended upon his residence, unearthing significant quantities of heroin and opium. This marked the pivotal turning point in the saga of the notorious Kingpin. Big Time Charlie found himself sentenced to a five-year term in the infamous Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas for his illegal drug trafficking activities. With his imprisonment, the empire he had so ruthlessly built crumbled into disarray. The story of what became of Charles Allen, or Big Time Charlie, after his release from prison actually remains shrouded in secrecy, lost to history, and leaving us to wonder about the ultimate destiny of this figure of the Wild West. Meet the legendary, and somewhat unknown, Apache Kid, a name that resonates with notoriety in the late 19th century. Born in 1860s on the San Carlos Reservation in Arizona, the kid, whose true name was Hoske Bay Ne Natel, was likely of White Mountain Apache descent. However, the citizens of the globe found his Native American name a bit challenging, so they simply called him the kid. From a young age, he picked up English and took on various odd jobs in Globe, where he formed an unlikely friendship with a renowned scout, Al Sieber. During this era in the Southwest, settlers faced constant threats from marauding Apache bands. General George Crook devised a strategy to employ Apache scouts to track down hostile Apache groups. The Apache Kid joined the initiative in 1881, quickly proving his skills and earning a promotion to sergeant in July of 1882. The following year, he accompanied General George Crook on an expedition into the Sierra Madre. In 1885-1886, during the Geronimo Campaign, the Apache Kid found himself in Mexico with Sieber. When Sieber was called back to the U.S. in the fall, Kid followed, but then he re-enlisted for Mexican duty and headed back south, in the Mexican town of Hasabas. A drunken brawl nearly cost the Apache Kid his life, but a lenient judge fined him $20 instead of sentencing him to death by firing squad. The army sent him back to San Carlos. In May of 1887, the Apache Kid was left in charge of Indian scouts and guardhouse at San Carlos while Captain Pierce and Al Sieber, his old friend, were away. During this time, a group of scouts decided to have an unlawful party um, where they made like a fermented fruit, corn beverage, essentially beer. Uh, tra tragically, this event led to the death of Kid's father, a man named Togo de Chuz, who was killed by a man named Gonzizi. In retaliation, Kid's friends killed Gonzizi and unsatisfied with the retribution, Kid went further and killed Gonzizi's brother. His brother's name is Rip. Upon returning to San Carlos on June 1st of 1887, the Apache Kid and other scouts were met by Captain Pierce and Al Sieber. When Pierce ordered the scouts to disarm, Kid was the first to comply. As they were being taken to the guardhouse, a shot rang out from the crowd and that had gathered to witness the event. Chaos erupted with shots fired indiscriminately. 
During this turmoil, the Apache Kid and several others managed to escape. Though it remains uncertain who fired the shot that hit Sieber, Sieber was the one who was hit, it undoubt it was for sure not the Apache Kid or the four scouts ordered in the guardhouse as they had been disarmed. In response, the army quickly dispatched two troops uh, of the 4th Cavalry to hunt down Kid and the other escapees. After two weeks of tracking along the San Carlos River, they located Kid and his group in the Rincon Mountains. The soldiers seized their horses and equipment, forcing the Apache to flee on foot into the rocky canyons. Kid communicated to General Miles that he and his group would surrender if the cavalry withdrew. Miles complied, and on June 25th of 1887, Apache Kid and seven of his followers surrendered. Following this surrender, the Apache Kid and four others were court-martialed, found guilty of mutiny and desertion, and sentenced to death by firing squad. General Miles, however, was dissatisfied with the outcome and ordered the court to reconsider the sentence. When the court reconvened on August 3rd, the sentences were reduced to life imprisonment. Miles later further reduced their sentences to 10 years. They began their sentence in the San Carlos guardhouse before being transferred to Alcatraz. Yes, the famous Alcatraz. However, their convictions were eventually overturned on October 13th due to bias amongst the officers in the court-martial trial. The Apache were released as free men and returned to the San Carlos, causing outrage among the local citizens. In October of 1889, a new warrant was issued in Gila County for the re-arrest of the Apache Kid, this time for assault with intent to commit murder against his friend Al Sieber. On October 25th of 1889, the Apache Kid and three others were found guilty and sentenced to seven years in Yuma Territorial Prison. During their transport to the prison, a violent escape occurred, leading to the death of one guard and the injury to another. Kid played a role in preventing further harm to the wounded guard. Although the escapees managed to flee, their tracks were erased by the snowstorm, and this event marked the last official sighting of the Apache Kid. Although, unverified reports of his whereabouts would continue to resurface for years. Over the following years, Apache Kid was implicated in various crimes. He was said to have led a small band of renegade Apache followers, raiding ranches and freight lines across New Mexico and Arizona and northern Mexico. Some accounts describe him as a lone wolf, despite by his own people he was feared uh, as an Anglo settler. He was believed to ki kidnap Apache women, using them until he grew tired of them and before committing further violence. Reportedly, he targeted lone ranchers, cowboys, and prospectors, killing them for resources uh, and all, everything they had on their ranches. The Arizona Territorial Legislator even offered a $5,000 reward for his capture, dead or alive, but the reward remained unclaimed. The Apache Kid's legacy is a mosaic of differing accounts, crimes, and controversies, all stemming from his quest to, for revenge against the Army's treatment of the Apache Scouts. His enigmatic name, the tall man destined to come true to his mysterious end, seems to have foretold a life of intrigue and obscurity. Although the details surrounding his demise remain elusive, a memorial gravesite in the San Mateo Mountains of the Cibaloa National Forest in New Mexico stand as a testament to the legend of the Apache Kid. Local lore holds that Apache Kid met his end at the hands of vengeful ranchers in the area, marked by a tree scorched by their fury, a hunting reminder of Kid's turbulent life. This site is located one mile northwest of Apache Kid's Peak at Cyclone Saddle, and that remains a piece of the Apache Kid's enduring legacy. Let's delve into the intriguing tale of George W. Brown, an alleged outlaw who was rumored to have connections with Henry Plummer's notorious game of The Innocents in the Wilds of Montana. George W. Brown's origins are believed to trace back to Minnesota. As he grew older, older, he entered the Union with a Sioux woman, and together they brought several children into the world. Brown's life took an adventurous turn during the Dakota War 1862 in Minnesota, when he took a role as a scout, serving under the command of Lieutenant Colonel William Rainey Marshall. However, by 1863, Brown had ventured westward to the untamed lands of Montana, where he was rumored to have played a significant role within the ruthless game known as the Innocents. In the year 1863 marked an end to the Montana Gold Rush, a time when the concept of law was a mere notion in a region, and that there was a vast part of the territory of Idaho where there was still 
lawlessness. This was an era where road agents ran rampant, uh, terrorizing the region by plundering roads, ambushing stagecoaches, raiding freight caravans, and particularly targeting ore wagons laden with valuable gold shipments. These violent exploits resulted in tragic deaths of nearly 100 individuals. This, as you can imagine, infuriated locals, who grew increasingly delusional with the slow and ineffective justice system, leading to the birth of the Montana Vigilantes. One of the prime suspects of the Vigilantes radar was Erastus Red Jaeger. The Vigilantes were embarked on a relentless mission to track him, ultimately locating him in remote stinking water valley within the Madison County. Yes, that is the weird name. Uh, in the company of Jaeger was none other than our new friend, George W. Brown. The Vigilantes informed Jaeger that he would be transported back to Virginia City to face trial. While there exists no actual documented confession, the Vigilantes claim that Jaeger made a comprehensive admission of guilt during their journey back to Virginia City. He not only revealed the identities of the, ma the majority of the road agents within the game, but also pointed an accusatory finger at Sheriff Henry Plummer, whom he identified as the leader. Following this revelation, both Jaeger and Brown faced a grim fate. They were deemed guilty by the posse and met their end on January 4th, 1864, where they were hanged from a sturdy branch of a cottonwood tree along the banks of the Ruby River, situated near Lauren, Montana. This location rested approximately 11 miles northwest of Virginia City. The vigilantes intentionally left the lifeless bodies hanging from the tree as a stark and chilling warning to anyone who would be outlaws. To further emphasize their point, a note was affixed to Jaeger's lifeless body, labeling him as Red, Road Agent and Messenger, while George Brown's received an ominous moniker, Brown, Corresponding Secretary. These grim reminders served as a stark testament to the uncompromising pursuit of justice in the untamed frontiers of Montana. Let me introduce our final outlaw of today's episode, a man named Charles or Charlie Bryant. He is also known as Blackface Charlie, whose life and exploits are woven into the fabric of Oklahoma's outlaw history. Charlie's journey takes us into the landscape of the Wild West adventures, gunfights, and his association with the notorious Dalton Gang. Charlie Bryant hailed from Wise County, Texas, and his journey into the world of outlaws began at a tender age. As a teenager, he embraced the life of a cowboy, immersing himself in the rugged ways of the frontier. However, fate took a dark turn when, still in his youth, he became entangled in a violent gunfight. The outcome was a face forever marked with the grains of black powder, a scar that earned him the moniker Blackface Charlie. In 1890, Charlie found himself drawn into the orbit of the infamous Dalton Gang. And if you don't know, it's a group of notorious uh, for their daring train robberies and audac audacious exploits. We'll be doing a full dive into the Dalton Gang in the future. His association with the gang would lead to his involvement in the brazen train robbery near Wharton, Oklahoma on May 9th of 1891, followed by another daring train heist near Red Rock just re weeks later. Charlie Bryant was a man who harbored a deep affection for the art of gunplay, regardless of the circumstance. This um, affinity to trigger happy behavior often led to the Daltons questioning his reliability. His quick impulse and trigger finger uh, made him a for formidable yet unpredictable member of the gang. So his first was to quote the old uh, movie with Will Smith, Wild West, we uh, shoot first, ask questions later. That's kind of what I get from it. Uh, during a period when the gang ca camped near Buffalo Springs, Oklahoma, Charlie fell ill and his condition uh, needed medical attention. He was transported to a doctor near Hennessy while uh, in a hotel, news of his whereabouts reached the ears of U.S. Deputy Marshal, uh, Deputy Marshal Edward Short. Without hesitation, Short moved swiftly to apprehend the outlaw. On a fateful day of August 3rd of 1891, Short and Charlie boarded a train bound for the Federal District Court of Wichita, Kansas. Fate, however, had a cruel twist in store. Short made an unfortunate decision to tempor temporarily leave Black Charlie under the watchful eye of the express car messenger while he relieved himself. Believing Charlie to be asleep, uh, the messenger momentarily set the guard down and focused on his duties. Yet, Charlie, the ever-cunning outlaw, had merely been feigning sleep. 
In an audacious move, he seized the opportunity snatching the revolver from the unsuspecting messenger and upon Short's return, fired a fatal shot into the marshal's chest as he re-entered the car. A desperate gunfight ensued and Short swiftly retaliated using his rifle, resulting in catastrophic consequences. Charlie Bryant's chest was ravaged by the return fire, severing his spinal column. As a train rumbled on, the lifeless bodies of both men bore witness to the tragic climax of their encounter. When the train finally reached Vaughn, Hank Vaughn, also known as Henry Clay Vaughn, was an infamous gunslinger and outlaw based out of the Oregon Territory during the height of the Wild West time period. Hank got his criminal start early in life. At age 15, he had shot a man who refused to pay for a horse. While on bail, Hank shot the man who filed the original complaint. Hank's family begged the judge to show mercy to their young son. The judge agreed, and he sent Hank to the army instead of prison. However, Hank was discharged after only 45 days. By the age of 18, Hank, along with a man named Dan Burns, had rustled some horses for the Umatilla Native Americans. This tribe was historically located in the north-central part of Oregon. Sheriff Frank Maddock and his deputy O.J. Hart quickly pursued Hank and Dan Burns. The lawmen snuck up on the outlaws during the early hours of the morning, and a gunfight ensued. Both Dan Burns and Deputy O.J. Hart were killed in the gunfight. Hank Vaughn and Sheriff Maddock were wounded, but they did live. Hank Vaughn escaped for the time being, but was caught and given a life sentence in the new territorial prison of Salem. Hank Vaughn's story does not end here. His family again began to beg for leniency, and the Oregon governor pardoned Hank Vaughn in 1870. He continued his outlaw life even after being married in 1875. He was involved in a gunfight in Arizona where Hank was shot in the head but survived. He made his way back to Oregon in 1878 and remarried, and from there he started rustling cattle with some Native Americans from the Umatilla Reservation. This caused anger to grow amongst the ranchers, and vigilantes had begun to form. This led to an altercation at the Till Glazes Saloon in Prineville, Oregon. A ranch boss named Charlie Long confronted Hank Vaughn, and Vaughn offered to buy Charlie Long a round of drinks. When Long refused, a gunfight broke out and both men were shot. Miraculously, both men survived. Vaughn continued cattle rustling and got into another altercation in 1886 with a man named Bill Falwell. Hank started shooting at Bill Falwell's feet, making him dance like you see in famous movies. In retaliation, Falwell shot Vaughn in the arm. In 1893, Vaughn went to Pendleton to get his horse shod and to get a couple drinks at saloons. On his way out, his horse slipped in its gallop and crushed Hank. Hank's skull was fractured and he survived two weeks in a coma until he finally died on June 15th of 1893. Hank Vaughn's buried in an unmarked grave in Pendleton, Oregon. Jim Miller Jim Miller, also known as Killer Miller, was an outlaw born in Van Buren, Arkansas in 1861. At just one, his family moved to Texas. Miller started his life of crime by murdering his sister's husband, a man named John Coop. Coop was found dead in his bed with a shotgun blast in 1880. It was well known that Killer Miller hated his brother-in-law, and he was soon arrested. Jim Miller was sentenced to life in prison, but his attorneys took the case to the Texas Court of Appeals, and the conviction was reversed on a technicality. This run-in with the law did not set Jim Miller straight. He hooked up with an outlaw gang in San Saba County, Texas, and began robbing trains, stayed coaches, and killing during both. 
Jim Miller bought into a saloon in San Saba and actually began a career as an assassin. His price varied between $150 to $2,000, and he earned a reputation for getting the job done quickly and efficiently. He was also known for assassinating targets at night with a shotgun. The wild thing about Jim Miller was his appearance. He didn't drink, he didn't curse, and didn't smoke. He was always very well dressed and known to regularly attend church. Some even called him Deacon Miller. He wasn't known as a fast draw for a gunfighter, but he would use his firearm when it suited him. Over the next few years, Miller became town marshal in Pecos, Texas, and gained a reputation for killing Mexicans, claiming that they were trying to escape. Miller then began a feud with the Pecos sheriff, Sheriff Bud Frazier. While away on business, Sheriff Bud Frazier heard that Jim Miller had planned a shootout for when the sheriff returned. Sheriff Frazier contacted the Texas Rangers to intercept his plans, and in September of 1893, Jim Miller, along with his accomplices, were arrested for conspiring to kill Sheriff Frazier. Jim Miller did find his way out of this one. He had his henchmen track down all the witnesses and had them killed. With no witnesses, the state was forced to let them go. By 1894, the feud between Sheriff Bud Frazier and Jim Miller would come to a head. Frazier encountered Jim Miller on the street and yelled, quote, Jim, you're a cattle rustler and a murderer, and opened fire. Sheriff Frazier shot Miller in the arm and emptied his pistol into Miller's chest, leaving him to die. There was something Sheriff Frazier didn't know about Jim Miller. Jim Miller wore a large black frock at all times. Underneath his frock, a metal breastplate to protect his chest from gunfire. Miller lived and Frazier moved to New Mexico after he lost his sheriff election. Miller continued his work as an assassin in the early 1900s, despite the fact that his family had become wealthy through real estate. He assassinated business rivals, attorneys, lawmen, and anyone who was on the receiving end of an assassination request. Even though Miller had been seen during these assassinations, he always found a way to stay out of jail. Either through self-defense claims or by having the witnesses murdered before trial. Miller's luck ran out in 1909. He was contracted by local ranchers Jesse West and Joe Allen through a middleman named Barry Burrell. The target was a man named Gus Bobbitt in Ada, Oklahoma. Bobbitt was a cattle rancher and former deputy U.S. Marshal. Gus Bobbitt was ambushed at his house after returning from town. Jim Miller shot Bobbitt in the side with a shotgun, his signature move. A 19-year-old cowhand, Oscar Peeler, was the witness to turn the men in and actually had been paid to lead the men to where Bobbitt lived. The Texas Rangers tracked the men down and extradited them to Oklahoma to stand trial. Ada residents knew Jim Miller's reputation for getting his convictions overturned and being acquitted for crimes that he committed. So, the town decided to take matters into their own hands. A group of roughly 30 to 40 members of a lynch mob broke into the jail around 2 or 3 in the morning and drug all four suspects to a stable behind the jail. Jim Miller remained stone cold as his three accomplices begged for their life. Jim Miller made a request to have his diamond ring be given to his wife and for him to wear his black hat while he was being hanged. The wishes were granted. It is reported that Jim Miller shouted, quote, let her rip, before voluntarily stepping off his box to hang. Jim Miller's body was returned to Texas, and he's buried at the Oakwood Cemetery in Fort Worth. John Wesley Hardin John Hardin was born in 1853 in the state of Texas and is known as one of the most notorious killers of the Texas frontier. Hardin got his criminal life started at the early age of 15 after killing an ex-slave named Mage after an altercation stemming from a wrestling match. Knowing that Union soldiers would come looking for him, 
Hardin's dad sent him into hiding. The authorities finally discovered his hiding place, and three Union soldiers were sent to arrest him. John Hardin decided to confront his pursuers, saying the following, quote, I waylaid them, as I had no mercy on men whom I knew only wanted to get my body to torture and kill. It was war to the knife for me, and I brought it on by opening the fight with a double-barrel shotgun and ended it with a cap-and-ball six-shooter. Thus, it was by the fall of 1868, I had killed four men and myself wounded in the arm. End quote. Hardin became a fugitive after this encounter and made his way across Texas drinking, gambling, and killing. There's also a tale about his run-in with the famous Wild Bill in Abilene, T- Kansas. While on the run, an 18-year-old John Hardin, who was known as Little Arkansas in town, was in the Bull's Head Tavern for a drink. A man named Ben Thompson tried his best to get Hardin to confront Wild Bill over a dispute at Ben's saloon. Ben Thompson told Hardin, quote, He's a damn Yankee. Picks on rebels, especially Texans, to kill. John Hardin responded, If Bill needs killing, why don't you kill him yourself? This is where the story really sounds like legend. While Bill confronted Hardin for wearing guns on him in town, it violated town ordinance. While Bill ordered Hardin to hand his guns over, and Hardin surprisingly agreed. When Wild Bill went to grab the guns, which he was handed butt first, John Hardin flipped them around to where the barrel was now facing Wild Bill. Now, historians think this is an unlikely story, but I think this is what makes legends of these outlaws so fascinating. The confidence and bravado they exhibit their entire life makes this story believable. In 1872, John Hardin got involved in a Texas feud between the Sutton and Taylor families. Hardin himself decided to ally with the Taylor family, and even more death followed. While celebrating his 21st birthday in Comanche, Texas, Hardin spotted a beloved deputy sheriff named Charles Webb. Hardin asked the deputy if he was there to arrest him, which the deputy replied that he was not there for that. Hardin then invited the sheriff over for a drink, but when the deputy entered the hotel, Hardin and his accomplices opened fire and killed the deputy. This murder would not go unpunished. The governor of Texas, Richard B. Hubbard, offered a reward for Hardin's arrest. The Texas Rangers intercepted letters that Hardin was sending to family and found out that Hardin had fled to Florida after the murder of Charles Webb. In 1877, the Texas Rangers caught up to Hardin and placed him under arrest. They were only able to subdue him after Hardin's Colt 44 pistol was caught in his suspenders. Hardin was tried for the killing of Charles Webb and sentenced to 25 years in prison in the town of Huntsville, Texas. While in prison, Hardin began to study theology and wrote an autobiography, which is said to be wildly exaggerated. In 1894, Hardin was released from prison after serving 17 years of his 25-year sentence. He moved to Gonzales, Texas and passed the state bar exam and obtained his license to practice law. John Wesley would meet his end on August 19th of 1895. John Wesley Hardin had gotten into an altercation with an El Paso lawman named John Selman Jr., after the lawman arrested one of Hardin's acquaintances. John Selman's father, Constable John Selman Sr., himself a notorious gunman and former outlaw, had a heated exchange with John Wesley Hardin. That evening, Hardin was playing dice at Acme Saloon, where he said his last words, quote, four sixes to beat. Shortly after, Selman Sr. shot Hardin in the back of the head. Selman was acquitted, but later died in a shootout. Hardin was said to have 27 confirmed kills, while he claimed to have 42 before his death. John Wesley Hardin is buried in El Paso. Dallas Stoudemire Dallas Stoudemire was born in Alabama in 1845 
and was a famed lawman and gunfighter who served his early years in the Confederate Army. Dallas was discharged when officers learned that he was only 15 when he enlisted in the Army, and his huge height allowed him to pass for an older man. He was wounded multiple times during the war, and is recorded to be six foot four by the end of the Civil War. After that war, Dallas went, went west and served three years with the Texas Rangers. He was known to be well-dressed and a gentleman around women, but when he drank, he was known as being extremely dangerous. His life after the Texas Rangers is undocumented until around 1878. It's believed he was living in Mexico because of his ability to speak Spanish so well. Dallas resurfaces as town marshal in New Mexico until his brother-in-law told him that they need help in El Paso because of how lawless the town had become. They wanted a lawman that had a, quote, rough reputation. Dallas traveled to El Paso, Texas, and within three days of his arrival, he was involved in arguably the most famous gunfight in Wild West history. This dispute is named, quote, four dead in five seconds gunfight. The gunfight was so famous that it made it to newspapers in San Francisco and New York. 75 heavily armed Mexican cowboys came looking for two younger cowboys who had been missing along with 30 cattle. They approached the county constable, Gus Krimkaw, and asked him to lead them to a possible location. Gus agreed and led them to a ranch owned by a man named Johnny Hale. There, they found the bodies of the missing cowboys, and two cattle rustlers named Peeler and Stevenson were arrested after bragging about the killings. John Hale the man who owned the ranch, and his friend George Campbell became angry that Gus Krimkaw had been the interpreter between the Mexican posse and the judge in El Paso. Later that day, the constable went into Keating's saloon and ran into George Campbell and a heavily intoxicated John Hale. An argument began, and John Hale grabbed a gun from George Campbell and shot Constable Gus. Hale took off running after realizing what he had done and ran right into Dallas Stoudemire. Dallas shot wildly, and a bullet hit an innocent Mexican bystander. When Hale peeked from behind the post he was hiding behind, Dallas Stoudemire shot him between the eyes. Seeing Hale go down, George Campbell threw his hands up and saying, quote, Gentlemen, this is not my fight. The wounded constable Krimkall disagreed and shot George Campbell in the wrist and the toe. And at the same time, Dallas Stoudemire spun around and shot Campbell in the stomach three times. When everything settled, John Hale, George Campbell, and Constable Krimkall, along with the innocent bystander, were dead. This started a feud between Stoudemire and a family called the Mannings. The Mannings were close friends to both Hale and Campbell. James Manning convinced former Deputy Marshal Bill Johnson to assassinate Dallas Stoudemire for his role in the famous gunfight. Bill Johnson agreed and got heavily intoxicated to commit the murder. Bill Johnson heard Dallas Stoudemire from his hiding place, but in his drunken stupor, tripped backward, causing his shotgun to fire into the air. Dallas saw this and shot Bill Johnson eight times, killing the man. The feud would end with a win for the Mannings. The following year, Doc Manning, James Manning, and Frank Manning confronted Dallas in a saloon to make, quote, a peace treaty. Tempers started to flare after Dallas began mocking the Mannings. Guns were drawn, and James Manning came up from behind Dallas Stoudemire and shot him behind the left ear, killing him instantly. Doc Manning started to beat Dallas over the head after he was killed with his own gun. Dallas Stoudemire's body was shipped back to Columbus, Texas with all expenses paid by the Masonic Lodge. He is buried in the Allington Cemetery in Colorado County, Texas. Dallas Stoudemire is known as the man who tamed El Paso, Texas. Commodore Perry Owens Commodore Perry Owens was born in Tennessee and was named after the great naval commander, Commodore Perry, who found his success over the British in the War of 1812. His family moved to Indiana, 
but by 13, Owens ran away from home to head west. He got his start hunting buffalo for the railroad and became an incredible shot. He was able to fire his rifle accurately from the hip and could fire pistols incredibly accurate in both hands. In 1881, at the age of 28, Owens moved to Navajo Springs, Arizona, which is present-day Holbrook. There are myths about Commodore Perry Owens and his encounters with the local Navajo. Owens allegedly killed two Navajo warriors and earned the name Iron Man. He was arrested by a U.S. Indian agent for the murder of a young Navajo boy, but Owens claimed that the boy was trying to rustle horses and was acquitted of murder by an Apache County jury. In 1886, Owens won the sheriff's office after earning the support of the Apache County Stock Growers Association, along with the Mormon and Mexican population living in the area. Owens was responsible for 21,177 square miles of territory. One of the newspapers said, quote, Mr. Owens is a quiet, unassuming man, strictly honorable and upright in his dealings with all men, and is immensely popular. Owens had the jail cleaned up and accounted for public funds down to the postage stamps that he used. Commodore Perry Owens is most famous for the Owens Blevins shootout. Sometimes it's called the Holbrook shootout. A man named Andy Cooper, whose real name was Blevins, he changed it because he was wanted in Texas, was accused of running a gang of horse thieves in northern Arizona. The pressure was on the sheriff to handle Andy Cooper and his gang of thieves. On September 4th of 1887, Sheriff Owens rode into town to serve a warrant for Cooper's arrest. Commodore Owens saw Andy Cooper and his brother John Blevins ride up to their house in Holbrook. Commodore Perry Owens knocked on the door and told the two that he had a warrant for Andy Cooper. Cooper refused to go and Commodore Perry Owens shot him with his Winchester. Owens then stepped off the front porch and shot John Blevins in the shoulder. A man named Moss Roberts sprung from the house to engage Commodore, but Commodore opened fire on Moss Roberts. After 10 seconds, the 15-year-old Sam Blevins rushed out of the door with Andy Cooper's pistol in his hand before Commodore Perry shot him dead in front of the young boy's own mother. Commodore Perry Owens calmly saddled his horse and rode off. The young Sam Blevins died immediately, while Cooper and Roberts died later. John Blevins was wounded, but survived and convicted of assault with intent to murder Commodore Owens. The gunfight was not a popular one in town, and Owens did not seek re-election for sheriff after that. Commodore Perry Owens died at the age of 66 in 1919 from brain disease. It is said that he saw the ghost of the men he killed before his death. Harry Tracy Harry Tracy was born in 1874 in Wisconsin and fell into a life of crime by rustling cattle. He killed Deputy Sheriff Arlie Grimes and two other men before hooking up with the famous outlaw Butch Cassidy and his gang, the Wild Bunch. In 1898, the gang killed a boy named William Strong during a robbery and was then heavily pursued by a posse. One of the posse, Valentine Hoy, was killed and Harry Tracy was arrested along with three other men. Harry Tracy escaped jail in Aspen, Colorado by almost killing a guard with a lead pipe. Harry Tracy made his way up to Portland, Oregon to continue his life of crime with a man named Dave Merrill. Both of these men were arrested in February of 1899, and Harry Tracy was sentenced to 20 years in the Salem, Oregon Penitentiary. In 1902, Harry Tracy and Dave Merrill escaped prison with the help of a female accomplice. Tracy and Merrill killed three men in their escape as well. Later that month, Harry Tracy killed his partner Dave Merrill for becoming weak in the state of Washington. Harry Tracy made his way up to the Seattle area and killed Detective Charles Raymond and Deputy John Williams on July 3rd. Harry Tracy was on the run again and was cornered in the ranch in Creston, Washington on August 6th. Harry Tracy killed two posse members 
and was then shot in the leg during the fight. With no way out of the gunfight, Harry Tracy turned the gun on himself and ended his own crime spree. The Seattle Times wrote about him on July 3rd of 1902, saying, quote, In all the criminal lore of the country, there is no record equal to that of Harry Tracy for cold-blooded nerve, desperation, and thirst for crime. Jesse James, compared with Tracy, is a Sunday school teacher. Nicholas Aragon Aragon is an outlaw that shows up on our Wild West radar with arguably the most famous outlaw of all time, Billy the Kid. Newspapers from the time called Aragon an old-time killer with over a dozen victims. Information about Aragon is pretty limited, but I did find a newspaper article that gives us a glimpse into the outlaw's life. This newspaper is from 1885, and I read, quote, Nicholas Aragon, the famous outlaw and murderer who was formerly a member of Billy the Kid's gang, was captured at the rendezvous near Chipolto, 30 miles out this morning. Deputy Sheriffs John Hurley and James Brent, both of Lincoln County, have been watching and following Aragon for some time, but until the middle or latter part of last week, they did not succeed in cornering their man. But at last, they traced him to the rendezvous and surrounded the premise, thereby cutting off his escape, at the same time keeping at a respectable distance to avoid being killed by the desperate man. Two Mexican women were in the adobe hut at the time, but upon awakening to the pending danger, Aragon advised them to surrender, which they did. They informed the officers that he was well-armed and well-supplied with ammunition and plenty to drink and eat and would never surrender. Deputy John Hurley of Fort Stanton mounted the roof of the hut, and while he was digging a hole in which to deposit fire to smoke out the desperado, he was shot and killed instantly by the man within. The others of the posse succeeded in placing fire on the roof, but it was too wet to burn. In an unguarded moment, Aragon exposed himself at the small window and was pierced by a shot in the shoulder from Brent's rifle and injured slightly. Then Brent crowded up to the window cautiously, but as he raised himself to look at it, he was shot by Aragon, the bullet grazing his cheek. Brent then left a guard over the place and rode to Las Vegas for reinforcements and giant powder to explode under the building. Sheriff Romero of this city and a posse went back with Brent, and later that day Aragon sent his guns out to Romero and surrendered. He was turned over to Brent, and unless he is lynched while en route, he will arrive in the morning and be placed in the Las Vegas jail. Robert Clay Allison Clay Allison was born in Tennessee and joined the Confederacy at the age of 20. He was discharged due to a head injury, but re-enlisted shortly after. Allison seemed to skirt the law a little bit in his time in the Wild West. He was famous for his incredibly violent temper. He would lead lynch mobs and vigilantes during his time as a rancher in Cimarron, New Mexico, and in the Panhandle of Texas. In 1870, a man named Charles Kennedy was being held in jail for the disappearance of a few strangers and Kennedy's old son. Clay Allison led a mob to the jail where they pulled Charles Kennedy out and hanged him. Kennedy's house was searched and they found all the missing people deceased, including his own son. Clay Allison allegedly decapitated Charles Kennedy after he was hung and placed his head on a pole in front of the St. James Inn in the town of Cimarron, New Mexico. Clay Allison was also known for his incredibly fast draw speed. A man named Chunk Colbert found this out the hard way. In 1874, Colbert and Allison went to the Clifton House in Colfax County, New Mexico for dinner. The two had been in a quarrel over a physical altercation Clay Allison had with Colbert's uncle. During the meal, Colbert drew his pistol on Allison, but the barrel of his gun got stuck under the table. Allison drew his own revolver and shot Chunk Colbert one time. When Clay Allison was asked why he would accept a dinner invitation from a man who would try to kill him, 
Allison said, quote, because I didn't want to send a man to hell on an empty stomach. In 1875, Clay Allison led a lynch mob to kill a man named Cruz Vega. Vega was accused of murdering Reverend F.J. Tolby, who was a Methodist circuit rider. Cruz Vega was caught by the lynch mob and hanged from a telephone pole in Cimarron, New Mexico. Members of Vega's family were enraged and went to confront Allison for his role in Cruz Vega's hanging. Vega's uncle, Francisco, tried to pull his revolver on Allison, but met the same fate as Chunk Colbert did. Clay Allison was faster and killed Francisco. Allison was charged, but the charges were dropped because it was ruled as self-defense. Allison also ran into some trouble in Los Animas, Colorado, after a dispute over the right to carry weapons in the town's city limits. Constable Charles Faber busted into a local saloon with Allison and his brother John inside and opened fire. John Allison was shot three times and lived. Clay Allison fired four shots back at the lawman and killed Constable Charles Faber. Both the Allison brothers were arrested, but again, charges were dropped because the constable initiated the gunfight. There are also stories of Clay Allison getting drunk in Texas and riding his horse naked through the town wearing only his holster and revolver. Allison died on July 1st, 1887, after he flipped a wagon full of supplies. He was buried the next day in Pecos Cemetery, but in 1975, he was moved to Pecos Park with arguably the coolest headstones I've ever seen. The first says, Robert C. Allison, gentleman, gunfighter. The other marker is at the foot of the grave and reads, quote, He never killed a man that did not need killing. Print Olive Born Isom Prentice Olive in Mississippi in 1840, he and his family made their way to Texas by covered wagon. He fought on the side of the Confederacy during the Civil War and started making his name as a rancher in 1866 with the assistance of his three brothers, Thomas, Ira, and Bob. Print quickly became one of the big cattle ranchers in the area. Although great fortunes could be made in the cattle industry after the Civil War, it could also be a pretty dangerous business. Print and his brothers were known to take the law into their own hands to protect their property. One notorious incident involved the murder of two suspected rustlers known as Turner and Crow. The men were killed by the Death of the Skins, an old Spanish method of torture. Wrapped alive in green cowhides, the men were left to die as the sun slowly caused the skin to contract. Since the skins used the olive brand, the murders were widely believed to be done by the olives. Despite an acquittal by the county court, many people continued to believe the brothers were guilty. The olives lived fairly violent lives during their time in the Old West. Thomas Olive was killed in a gunfight. Bob shot a rancher named Cal Nutt, but was never convicted. The Olives decided to move to Nebraska in 1878 after a brief time in Colorado. They again found success ranching cattle, but their violent tendencies followed them. They found themselves in a fight with the neighboring ranchers, and Bob Olive was killed in a gunfight. When the neighboring ranch owner was found innocent, Print Olive led a lynch mob to hunt the two men down. They caught up with them and had them hanged and lit on fire. This gave Print Olive the name Manburner. Print was convicted of second degree manslaughter charges, but the charges were dropped when the original witnesses failed to show up in court. Print Olive lost most of his fortune in legal fees and a downturn in the beef market. His family relocated to Colorado, and Print Olive was shot and killed by a man named Joe Sparrow in 1886 over a $3.50 gambling debt. Wild Bill Longley Born in Mill Creek, Texas, Longley got his criminal start early in life. After the Civil War was over, the Texas governor created a state police force made up of mostly freed slaves. 
One of these men was supposedly drunk and insulted Wild Bill's father and threatened him with a gun. Wild Bill told the man to lower his gun, and when the police officer started to aim at Wild Bill, Bill drew his gun and shot the man dead. Wild Bill went on to terrorize and kill two more black men in Lexington, Texas. In 1868, Wild Bill and two friends killed a former slave named Green Evans. Wild Bill would challenge many people to duel him and loved to pick fights with anyone he deemed a Yankee sympathizer or carpetbagger. Longley drifted around Texas with his brother-in-law, John Wilson, and began a crime spree. The pair robbed settlers and killed a freed slave named Paul Bryce in Bastrop, Texas, and a freed slave woman in Evergreen. Longley actually tried to go straight in 1870 and joined the U.S. Cavalry in Wyoming. He signed up for five years, but deserted after just two weeks of the strict lifestyle. He was captured and sentenced to two years hard labor. His marksmanship skills were noticed and he was assigned to a hunting party after just four months. But he deserted again in 1872 and made his way back down to Texas in 1873. He killed another freed slave in Bastrop and was actually arrested for a huge reward on his head. It's not 100% clear, but it is thought that someone bribed the sheriff and Longley was released. In 1875, Longley actually killed his childhood friend, Wilson Anderson, with a shotgun. Longley's uncle allegedly instigated the killing for the revenge of his own son. Longley fled and ended up killing a hunting buddy of his named George Thomas after a fistfight. By 1876, Wild Bill had killed another outlaw named Loud Schroyer. Even more attention had been placed on Wild Bill and he fled to East Texas where he became a sharecropper for a preacher. His violent past would not elude him. The preacher's nephew had shown affection for a young woman that Wild Bill had his eyes on. Longley beat up the preacher's nephew and was arrested and jailed. Wild Bill Longley escaped jail and rode straight to the preacher's farm and found the preacher milking a cow. He walked up and shot the preacher dead with a shotgun. This is documented as the last man killed by Wild Bill Longley. Wild Bill fled to Louisiana, but the law finally caught up with him. He was captured in DeSoto Parish, Louisiana to stand trial for the death of his childhood friend, Will Anderson. He was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. Wild Bill wrote letters asking for leniency even using our old friend John Wesley Harden's sentence of 25 years in prison as proof that his sentence was too harsh. On October 11th of 1878, the 27-year-old Wild Bill Longley stepped onto the gallows, even making a joke about the boards that need to be repaired. 4,000 people showed up in Giddings, Texas to watch Wild Bill. His last words were, quote, I deserve this. It is a debt I have owed for a wild and reckless life. So long, everybody. To everyone's surprise, the hangman cut the rope too long and Wild Bill Longley's feet could barely touch the ground. The guards and the sheriff had to run underneath the gallows to hold Longley's feet off the ground so he could be hanged. It is said that it took Wild Bill Longley 11 and a half minutes to be pronounced dead. He's buried in the Giddings Cemetery in Giddings, Texas. He was a notorious and merciless murderer who left a trail of death across the American frontier. As a Confederate guerrilla during the Civil War, he refused to abandon his violent ways after the war's end. Instead, he targeted Reconstructionists, killed former slaves, and spread terror through Texas and Arkansas for a span of four years. Born on June 22nd of 1835 in Weekly County, Tennessee to John and Elizabeth Baker, Cullen actually grew up in Clarksville, Arkansas after his family relocated there. A few years later, they settled in Davis County, Texas, where Cullen's father obtained a land grant of 640 acres. Despite this, the family remained impoverished and Cullen, often teased the school for his humble attire, developed his fighting spirit. He acquired an old pistol and a rusty but functional rifle, honing his skills with these weapons until he became highly proficient. 
At the age of 15, Cullen had his first taste of whiskey, which fueled his quick temper and led him to provoke fights with boys and men who crossed his path. Spending much of his time in saloons, he gained a reputation as a belligerent, quarrelsome, and mean-spirited individual. During a brawl, he was struck unconscious by Morgan Culp, who had hit him in the head with a tomahawk. Although this incident momentarily subdued his temper, it did not last. In January of 1854, still sporting a bandage on his head, Baker married 17-year-old Martha Jane Petty and settled into a seemingly quiet life as a farmer. However, just eight months later, he reverted to his old ways. One night, fueled by alcohol, he engaged in a verbal altercation with a young man named Stalkup. Enraged, Baker lashed out and nearly beat Stalkup to death with a whip. As a result, Baker was charged with the crime and sought retribution by shooting one of the witnesses, a man named Wesley Bailey, in both of his legs with a shotgun, leaving him wounded outside of his home. Bailey succumbed to his injuries just a few days later. Fearing arrest for murder, Baker fled to Perry County, Arkansas, seeking refuge from his uncle, Thomas Young, where he stayed for nearly two years. During his time in Arkansas, Baker fatally stabbed a man named Wortham during an argument about horses in 1856. He then returned to Texas, but learned that he was still wanted for murder of Bailey. Meanwhile, his wife Martha gave birth to a daughter named Louisa Jane on May 24th of 1857. Baker briefly returned to Texas to retrieve his wife and child, but never saw his daughter again. Tragedy struck when Martha died on July 2nd of 1860, plunging Baker into grief. However, his, sor his sorrow didn't prevent him from, from proposing to Martha's 16-year-old sister, Belle Foster, just two months later. Bell rejected his advances and married another man, a man named Thomas Orr, a school teacher and political activist. Baker began harassing Orr, attempting to start fights, assaulting him with a tree limb, and even verbally abusing him in front of his students. As Reconstruction commenced in Arkansas and Texas, Baker developed a deep disdain for the changes taking place. Partnering with outlaw Lee Rames, Baker formed a gang based in the treacherous Sulphur River Bottoms near Bright Star, Arkansas. Engaging in robbery and murder, the gang claimed lives of at least 30 individuals showing no mercy regardless of their allegiance. They often ambushed and shot victims in the back or outnumbered them. Baker's reign of terror extended to Texas where he killed John Sammons, the murderer of Seth Rames, a member of his gang, and Lee Rames' brother. He also took lives of W.G. Kirkman, a Reconstruction official, and George W. Barron, who had participated in a posse seeking his capture. The gang continued their lawless spree into Queen City, Texas, and Texarkana, Arkansas, right there on the border of Texas and Arkansas, hence the name Texarkana. On June 1st of 1867, Baker visited Cass County, Texas, where he entered the Rowden General Store, absconded with items, and refused to pay. The store's owner, John Rowden, confronted Baker at his house, demanding payment while armed with a shotgun. Baker promised to return and settle the debt, but on June 5th, he instead killed Rowden. Fleeing back to Arkansas, Baker encountered a Union sergeant at a ferry and recognized him and shot and killed the officer. Although a private managed to escape and report the murder, Union forces relentlessly pursued Baker. On July 25th of 1867, an argument broke out between Baker and several Union soldiers near New Boston, Texas, escalating into a violent gunfight. Baker sustained an arm injury, but succeeded in killing Army Private Albert E. Titus. This act resulted in a $1,000 reward for his capture, dead or alive. In December of 1867, Baker joined forces with a group planning a raid on Howell Smith's farm in Bright Star, Arkansas. Smith had recently hired freed slaves, which incited Baker and his cohorts. During the attack, one of Smith's daughters was stabbed and another was clubbed and a man lost his life. However, Smith fought back, triggering a shootout that left several raiders injured, including Baker, who suffered a gunshot wound to the leg. On October 24th of 1868, Baker and his gang were reported to be involved in the murders of Major P.J. Andrews, Lieutenant H.F. Willis, and an unidentified black man in Little Rock, Arkansas. 
Lee Rames, Baker's co-leader, grew skeptical of Baker's leadership and believed his actions would lead to the gang's downfall. Rames defied Baker, who ultimately backed down, resulting in the gang's dissolve. Uh, they were dissolved in December of 1868. All members except Dummy Kirby, which is the first time I've heard somebody call that, uh, Dummy Kirby sided with Rames. Baker and Kirby sought refuge with Baker's in-laws in Bloomberg, Texas in January of 1869. It was there that both Colum Baker and Dummy Kirby met their demise on January 6th of 1869. The exact circumstances of their deaths remain a little unknown. Uh, according to one account, Baker's father-in-law and his acquaintances laced a bottle of whiskey and some of the food with uh, poison, uh, causing both the men to die. Afterwards, the bodies were riddled with bullets. Another version suggests that Thomas Orr, who was with Baker and had a long-standing feud, led a group of men to ambush Baker and Kirby at the Foster's home, resulting in their deaths. Following their demise, the bodies were paraded through Bloomberg before being publicly displayed at a U.S. Army post near Jefferson, Texas. Thomas Orr reportedly collected a portion of the reward money offered for Baker. Cullen Baker was laid to rest in Oakwood Cemetery in Jefferson, Texas, and despite his desertion from Morgan's squadron, a Confederate cavalry unit, um, he was it's still indicated on his grave marker. Some people actually romanticize Baker for defending the Southern honor, and his record proves him to be an unrelenting killer who murdered anyone who provoked him, regardless of their affiliations. There are some estimates that suggest that Cullen Baker was responsible for, for 50 to 60 deaths, uh, earning him a place as one of the most merciless killers in history um, and recognized by authorities and historians alike. Seaborn Barnes, famously known as Nubbins Colt, emerged from the shadows of Texas as a notorious outlaw riding alongside the legendary Sam Bass. Hailing from the rugged territory of Cass County, Texas in the year 1849, Barnes was a product of a life untouched by formal education. Illiteracy consumed his existence as he ventured into the realm of cowboy during his tender teenage years. Fueled by his inability to tolerate the potent brews of the saloon, he found himself embroiled in countless brawls that reverberated through the dimly lit establishments. The consequences of his fiery temperament landed him behind the cold bars of Fort Worth Penitentiary, serving a year sentence for a fateful shooting incident that unfolded when he was just 17 years old. Not long after his release, the relentless arms of the law closed in on Barnes once again in 1874, this time in Callahan County. Yet, like a phantom dancing in the moonlit darkness, he managed to elude their grasp slipping away from captivity. It was in the year of 1878 that Barnes forged an alliance with the formidable Sam Bass Gang, swiftly ascending to the coveted position of Bass's chief lieutenant. Together, they embarked on a spree of audacious train robberies during the vibrant spring months of the same year. However, destiny twisted its hand when they set their sights on the bank in the town of Round Rock, Texas, just outside of Austin, uh, on July 19th of 1878. But the gang's destiny actually had a cruel secret. The sun-drenched day of July 19th of 1878 saw the ambitious outlaws set their sights on the treasured vault of the Round Rock Bank in Round Rock, Texas. Unbeknownst to them, a serpent lurked in their midst. A new recruit named Jim Murphy, whose heart had been swayed by the allure of betrayal. Murphy had turned informant, his whispers reaching the ears of the vigilant and always watching Texas Rangers, who were lying in wait. The stage was set for the ultimate confrontation, the dance of bullets and the clash of fates. In that fateful moment, a merciless hail of gunfire claimed the life of Seaborn Barnes. A bullet to the head extinguished him instantly. Meanwhile, Sam Bass, battered and bloodied, clung to life with unwavering tenacity. Mounting his steed, he escaped the clutches of the Round Rock, accompanied by a few rogue named Frank Jackson, vanishing into the abyss of uncertainty. Yet, the following day unveiled the harrowing truth. Bass, the wounded outlaw who dared to defy death, lay lifeless on the ground. 
his fate sealed by the revelation of Jim Murphy, the turncoat whose treachery had set in motion the events. Frank Jackson, a shadow in the wind, disappeared into oblivion, leaving behind only whispers and faded memories. Seaborn Barnes found eternal solace in the sacred grounds of Round Rock Cemetery, where he was laid to rest beside his fallen comrade, Sam Bass, and etched upon his weathered tombstone, a testament to his unwavering loyalty stood the words that echoed through the ages. He served as the steadfast anchor guiding Sam Bass through the stormy seas of their outlaw legacy." End quote. Ann Bassett, a remarkable rancher with a fiery spirit, commanded attention amidst the rugged landscapes of Browns Hole, Colorado. Nestled near the border of Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah, this isolated region possessed an air of lawlessness, beckoning outlaws and renegades like moths to a flame. It stood as a notorious haven for horse thieves, cattle rustlers, and notorious outlaws of the area, rivaling the infamous hideouts of Hole in the Wall, Wyoming, and Robber's Roost in Utah. Here, amid the untamed wilderness, Anne's story unfolded. Born on May 12th of 1878 to parents Herb and Elizabeth Chamberlain Bassett, they presided over a ranch that epitomized both the isolation and allure of the area. Their humble abode perched on the edge of the wild frontier, welcoming danger and adventure with open arms. Her father, Herb, a man unassuming yet harboring hidden connections, conducted business with outlaws who straddled the blurred lines between lawlessness and legend. Among his acquaintances were the infamous Butch Cassidy, the audacious Harvey Kid Curry Logan, and an enigmatic Black Jack Ketchum. Through horse trades, beef sales, and provisional transactions, Herb danced on the fringes of legitimacy, his activities serving as a lifeline to those living on the wild side. Despite the untamed nature of the surroundings, the Bassett sisters, Anne and Josie, exuded a rare elegance that bellied their rustic upbringing. These fetching young women received education befitting of the highest echelons of society, attending esteemed boarding schools that cultivated their intelligence and grace. Yet, their father Herb instilled into them practical skills that set them apart from their refined peers. They mastered the arts of riding and roping and shooting and became adept at the ways of the untamed frontier. It was within this vivid tapestry of wild beauty and uncharted possibilities that Anne and Josie encountered the legendary outlaws. Butch Cassidy, and his audacious gang, the Wild Bunch. Drawn to the sisters' radiant allure, their intelligence, and the articulate voices, these outlaws found solace in company with the companionship of Anne and Josie. At the tender age of 15, Anne, too, succumbed to the allure of Butch Cassidy's charismatic presence, embarking on a passionate romance that defied societal norms. Meanwhile, Josie found herself entangled with Elza Leigh, further weaving the threads of love and adventure into their lives. Even the outlaws Ben Kilpatrick and Will News Carver, later infamous members of the Wild Bunch gang, courted the captivating Bassett sisters drawn by their irresistible charm. Amidst the backdrop of their unconventional lifestyle, Anne's father, a man content to fade into the background, entrusted the ranch's operations to Elizabeth, Anne's indomitable mother. Faced with encroaching cattle barons who sought to seize control of Brown's Hole, Elizabeth, driven by her own feud with these powerful men, dabbled in a touch of cattle rustling. An audacious act of defiance, it earned her the title Queen of the Rustlers, amongst those who whispered her name in hushed tones. As Anne grew into her own, she embraced her mother's righteous fury, directing it squarely at the Two Bar Ranch, a symbol of the oppressive cattle barons. Her actions spoke louder than her words, and she liberally helped herself to their prized cattle, becoming a thorn in the side of those who sought to dominate the untamed frontier. Whispers and accusations painted a darker portrait of Anne in her mother's defiance. Rumors swirled that they sent two bar cattle hurtling off treacherous cliffs in an act of spiteful revenge. These tales reached the ears of the cattle barons, their wrath demanding action. It was then that they employed the services of Tom Horn, a man who possessed the reputation as a formidable as the mountains that cradle Brown's Hole. 
tasked with infiltrating this wild domain, Horn set forth on a mission to silence the defiant voices that refused to yield. When Matt Rush, Isom Dart, and other ranchers stood their ground, their resolve unyielding, Horn resorted to violence. His bullets felled those who dared challenge his authority, their lives cut short amid the echoing canyons and vast expanse of Brown's Hole. In a twist of fate, Anne's path veered towards marriage with H. Bernard, the manager of Two Bar Ranch, sparking a storm of controversy. Their union ignited a powder keg of tension, resulting in Bernard's swift dismissal from his post. For six years, their relationship stood as a testament to the complexities of love amid the wild frontier. Yet, Anne's spirit remained untamed, her rebellious nature compelling her to snatch cattle from the very ranch she had married into, a defiant act that would forever etch her name into the annals of infamy. When she faced trial for her audacity, the courtroom drama unfolded, gripping the hearts and minds of all who witnessed it. Ultimately, Anne emerged from the crucible of justice, acquitted and unscathed, her resilience an enduring testament to her domital spirit. In 1928, Anne embarked on a new chapter of her life, bidding farewell to the rugged landscapes that had shaped her existence. She wed a man named Frank Willis, who brought stability and a sense of settling to her tumultuous journey. Together, they brought solace in a small town nestled in the southwestern reaches of Utah, where the vast horizons whispered a quieter existence. There, Anne found respite from her windswept drama of her youth, cultivating a peaceful existence that would carry her through the twilight of her life. Though some sought to intertwine her story with that of Etta Place, an elusive figure of the Wild West, Historians have largely dismissed such claims, allowing Anne Bassett to etch her name in as a singular force in the annals of frontier history. And so at the age of 78, Anne departed this world, leaving behind a legacy that would forever illuminate the untamed spirit that thrived within the heart of the American West. Isaac Ike Black, a notorious outlaw, wreaked havoc in the territories of Kansas and Oklahoma during the late 19th century. Initially, Black's criminal exploits began with cattle theft in Kansas, which eventually led to his incarceration in the Kansas Penitentiary. Upon his release, he sought refuge in Oklahoma, where fate brought him together with another wanted outlaw named Zip Wyatt. Wyatt had a criminal record for injuring two individuals in Oklahoma and murdering Deputy Sheriff Andrew Balfour in Kansas. United with their shared fugitive status, Black and Wyatt formed an audacious gang that embarked on a spree of robberies throughout the region. One notable incident occurred in November of 1893 when they successfully looted the Hightower store and post office in Arapahoe, Oklahoma. To evade capture, Black and Wyatt sought refuge in the treacherous Gypsum Hills, where their wives admirably supported them by providing food and supplies. As their criminal activities escalated, they became prime suspects in nearly every crime committed within the territory, promptly uh, intensifying a manhunt by the lawmen of the area. Rumors circulated that Ike Black and Zip Wyatt had aligned themselves with the infamous Doolin Dalton gang, allegedly taking part in the daring Rock Island train robbery in Dover, Oklahoma on April 3rd of 1895. However, there's no concrete evidence that was ever confirmed this claim. On June 3rd of 1895, an outlaw gang, potentially including Black and Wyatt, targeted the store and post office in Fairview, Oklahoma, ransacking the premise and making off of valuables, goods, and three horses. U.S. Deputy Marshal Gus Hadwinger and J.K. Reynolds, Woods County Sheriff Clay McGrath and Deputy Marion Hildreth promptly gave chase, eventually cornering the gang in a concealed cave near the county line. A fierce gunfight ensued, resulting in Black sustaining a foot injury and Wyatt being shot in the left arm. Despite their injuries, the outlaws managed to elude capture. The relentless pursuit continued with the number of lawmen seeking them growing to nearly 200 people. On July 26, 1895, Black and Wyatt targeted the Oxley Post Office and store in Oklahoma. Their ill-fated heist yielded a meager loot of $35 and some supplies. However, their identities were recognized during the robbery, prompting a posse to form and pursue them the next day. 
Track to a location near Salt Creek, approximately six miles northwest of Oxley, the outlaws found themselves in yet another firefight. Black suffered a flesh wound to the head, but both men miraculously managed to escape. Their horses had fled during the chaos, leaving them stranded on foot. Desperate means for an escape uh, were needed. Black and White reached a farm five miles west of Okini, Oklahoma, not sure if I said that right, Okine, Oklahoma, where they absconded with horses and a cart. Another posse, led by Robert Callison, the former constable of Forest Township, was assembled determined to bring the outlaws to justice. The pursuit led them to a canyon on July 28th, where gunfire erupted once again, resulting in Frank Pope, a member of the posse, being shot in the leg. Despite the exchange of bullets, Black and White again nearly eluded escape. The original posse joined forces with another from Alva, Oklahoma, led by Deputy Sheriff Marion Hildreth, who continued the relentless pursuit southeast. Eventually, Black and Wyatt sought refuge in a makeshift shack located approximately four miles east of Cantonment, which is present-day Canton. On August 1st of 1895, when the posse finally closed in on them, a violent confrontation ensued. Tragically, Isaac Black was fatally shot in the head and succumbed to his injuries. Wyatt, although wounded in the left side of the chest, managed to evade capture temporarily before being apprehended a few days later. U.S. Deputies, Sheriffs Marion Hildreth and J.W. Meir transported Black's lifeless body in a horse-drawn wagon to Alva for burial. All that remained on his person were a modest belongings, his photograph of his wife, Belle, a dollar fifty in silver coins, and copies of two ballads. Isaac Black laid to rest in an unadorned pauper's grave at the Alva Municipal Cemetery, and he was buried at the county's expense. Charles E. Bowles, commonly known as Black Bart, was a captivating American outlaw who etched his name into the history books with the poetic messages he left behind during his daring robberies. His magnetic personality earned him the nickname Charlie amongst his companions, and he was sometimes known as Charles or C.E. With an air of elegance and sophistication, <laughs> he embodied the essence of a gentleman bandit, becoming a legendary figure notorious for his exploits in Northern California and Southern Oregon during the 1870s and 1880s. Charles was born in England, and at the age of two, they made the move from England to Jefferson County, New York to settle their family in America. He was fueled by the fervor of the California Gold Rush, and him and his brother David and James embarked on a quest in 1849 to find their own riches in California. They did return home in 1852, but fate beckoned the Bulls back to the West Coast. Unfortunately for his brothers David and Robert, both of them succumbed to illness as soon as they arrived, and Charles was re to remain in California for the next two years, but eventually the disappointment of his brothers and his lack of success made him retrace his steps to the east. In 1854, there was a significant turning point in Bull's life, and he married the love of his life, a woman named Mary Elizabeth Johnson. And by the dawn of 1860, the couple had found themselves in Decatur, Illinois, raising their four children in their humble abode. The eruption of the Civil War beckoned Bowles to don the uniform of a private in the Company B, 116th Illinois Regiment. Remarkably, his exemplary service and unwavering dedication earned him the rank of first sergeant within a year. He fought valiantly and witnessed the horrors of battle including the fateful encounter, encounter at the Battle of Vicksburg. And later, he joined Sherman's march to the sea. Recognized for his valor, he received commissions as both a second lieutenant and first lieutenant. On June 7th of 1865, he was honorably discharged alongside his regiment in the hollowed grounds of Washington, D.C., where he was finally reunited with his family in Illinois. Driven by an insatiable thirst for adventure and fortune, he once found his lure to the unknown. In 1867, he embarked on a journey to Idaho and Montana, embracing the arduous life as a gold prospector. A surviving letter from August of 1871 reveals a troubling encounter with Wells Fargo and company agents, further igniting the flames of revenge that built within him. Tragically, 
His wife never received another letter, leading her to believe that he had perished in the treacherous wilderness. Thus emerged the criminal career of the enigmatic Black Bart. Donning his infamous moniker, he proceeded to terrorize Wells Fargo stagecoaches, perpetrating a staggering 28 watt robberies across the landscapes of Northern California between 1875 and 1883. His audacious exploits extended along the historic Siskiyou Trail. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. I think it's Siskiyou or Siskiyou. Um, either way, the Siskiyou Trail that weaves between California and Oregon. Although he only left behind two poetic gems, one at the fourth and one at the fifth robbery sites, these verses became his signature, ensuring that his name would echo through time. Black Bart's ventures proved overwhelmingly fruitful, amassing him a fortune that often reached thousands of dollars per year, and given the time, it'd be a lot of money. Black Bart was a captivating with his criminal prowess. He actually was plagued by irrational fears of horses, which is kind of shocking given the time, but he executed all of his heists on foot. He would adorn a long linen duster coat and crowned with a stylish bowler hat. He concealed his identity behind a makeshift mask crafted from a flour sack uh, and had holes cut out to, so he could see. A shotgun remained firmly gripped in his hands, but he never resorted to violence, capturing the attention of the public and cementing his image as an anomaly in the realm of outlaws. Bowles maintain a consistent air of politeness and refrain from using foul language, despite its occasional presence in his poetic verses. He conducted himself with refined demeanor, leaving a lasting impression on all who encountered him. His signature attire, paired with his nonchalant approach to his criminal endeavors, became the defining traits of Black Bart's unforgettable persona. The chronicles of Black Bart's criminal exploits started in July 26th of 1875 when he orchestrated his maiden stagecoach robbery in California. Commanding a deep and resonant voice, he politely instructed stage driver John Shine to surrender the coveted strongbox. With a commanding gesture, he warned, quote, if he dares to shoot, give him a solid volley, boys, prompting Shine to swiftly relinquish his prize. After Black Bart vanished into thin air, Shine ventured to retrieve the strongbox, only to discover that the menacing rifle barrel protruded from the nearby bush was nothing more than a carefully orchestrated decoy. Black Bart's audacious debut gave him about $160. The curtain fell on Black Bart's career with his final robbery of November 3rd of 1883 at the very location that his first heist had unfolded, a place called Funk Hill nestled southeast of present-day Copperopolis. Concealing his visage behind his familiar flower sack mast, he initiated his calculated assault on the stagecoach, driven by Reason McConnell. Pretty cool name, I've never heard the name Reason. Uh, as it crossed the Reynolds Ferry along the age-old route of the Sonora to Milton. At the ferry, a man named Jimmy Rolari, son of the ferry owner, eagerly joined the stage, armed with his trusty rifle. Descending at the foot of the hill to embark on a hunting excursion along the creek, Rolari intended to reunite with the stage on the other end. As he reached the western end of the summit, he saw the stage driver with a team of horses. Reason McConnell shared the tale of Bull's ambush, recounting how the outlaw had emerged from behind a boulder, brandishing his shotgun at the stage approaching its zenith. Forcing Reason McConnell to unhitch the team and transport them across the crest of the hill, Black Bart was able to turn his attention to the elusive strongbox with the stagecoach still there. To his dismay, he encountered it in an unexpected hurdle. The box had been securely bolted to the floor and required substantial effort to dislodge. As Reason McConnell and Jimmy Rolari ascended the hill, they glimpsed at Black Bart uh, moving himself from the stage while he was clutching the precious strongbox. Reason McConnell grabbed Rolari's rifle and took two shots at the fleeing bandit, but he missed. Jimmy Rolari seized his opportunity and fired at Black Bart himself as he retreated into the concealment of thick foliage. Black Bart stumbled, seemingly struck by the bullet. 
Racing towards the thicket, the pursuers discovered a small, blood-stained parcel, a bundle of mail the outlaw had inadvertently dropped. Wounded in the hand, Black Bart continued his desperate flight until he reached a quarter-mile mark where he succumbed to exhaustion. Grasping a tattered handkerchief, he staunchly wrapped it around his hand to curb the bleeding. Finding his solace behind a decaying log, he actually stashed the gold within that in like a hidden recess, uh, retaining just $500 in gold coins. Concealing his shotgun within the hollow of a mighty tree, he abandoned all other remnants of his criminal past and vanished into the abyss. In a manuscript scribed by the driver, Reason McConnell, nearly two decades after the heist, he claimed to have discharged all four rounds at Black Bart. Though he thought he missed his mark, McConnell surmised that either the second or third bullet found its target, while he remained certain that the fourth had struck the elusive outlaw. Curiously, Black Bart suffered only a single wound to his hand. The pursuit of justice ensued once Black Bart's escape concluded, and he unwittingly left behind an assortment of like his personal effects. Among them were his eyeglasses, remnants of his meal, a handkerchief adorned with the laundry mark FX07, Wells Fargo detectives James B. Hume and Harry N. Morse embarked on a quest uh, meticulously visiting nearly 90 laundries throughout San Francisco in search of the origins of the mysterious mark. The tenacity of their search uh, landed them to Ferguson and Biggs California Laundry on Bush Street, where they unearthed a vital clue. Ownership of the handkerchief belonged to a resident of a modest boarding house. Unraveling it further, Detectives unveiled a portrait of Black Bart as a self-proclaimed mining engineer, frequently embarking on, quote, business trips, his thefts, the business trips, that conveniently coincided with Wells Fargo's ill-fated encounters. Initially denying any association with Black Bart, Charles Bowles eventually admitted to his involvement in multiple stagecoach robberies. However, he only confessed to crimes committed before 1879 and he believed that the statute of limitations had lapsed for his earlier crimes. When formally booked, he identified himself as T.Z. Spaulding, but the authorities stumbled upon a Bible, a cherished gift from his wife inscribed with his true name. The police painted Bowles as, quote, a person of great endurance, who exhibited genuine wit under the most trying circumstances, and was extremely proper and polite in behavior. Ultimately, Black Bart faced justice and received six-year sentence in San Quentin Prison for the final robbery. However, his exemplary conduct during his prison sentence earned him an early, early release after just four years, in January of 1888. His time behind bars had taken a visible toll on his well-being, marked by visible aging, failing eyesight, and partial deafness in one ear. Reporters besieged him upon his liberation, inquiring if he had harbored intentions of resuming his criminal exploits. With a disarming smile, he responded, he responded, quote, No, gentlemen, I'm through with crime. I didn't do a British accent, but I just figured I'd try to smart it up a little bit. Uh, Bowles on his release never returned to his wife, although he did maintain a correspondence with her. In one of his letters, he expressed weariness from the constant surveillance of Wells Fargo, a sense of demoralization, and an urgent desire to escape the shackles of society. In February of 1888, Bowles abruptly just vanished, bidding farewell to the Nevada house and slipping into the realm of obscurity. Hume, the person who helped investigate him from Wells Fargo, claimed that Wells Fargo had traced him to the Visalia house, uh, hotel in Visalia, but the hotel owner attested that the figures check in um, was just kind of a disappearance. Uh, the sighting of Black Bart on February 28th of 1888 marked the final trace of the notorious outlaw. His ultimate fate and hid the circumstances of his later life are a mystery, and they, we do not know what happened to him when he left that hotel. The legend of Black Bart endures as an embodiment of the extraordinary and inexplicable things that happened in the Wild West. A gentleman bandit who adorned the pages of history with poetic verse. He captured the imagination of the public and he carved his place in the annals of outlaw lore. 
The tale of Black Bart serves as a testament to the allure of the Wild West, where figures like him roamed the untamed frontier, defying conventions and leaving behind a legacy that continues to captivate generations of fans, including pretty much everybody on this channel. Before we end this episode, please don't leave because I am going to read the poems that he left that are authenticated to be Black Bart's poems. He left at uh, his robberies. This first one was found at the scene August 3rd of 1877 during a stage holdup from Point Arena to Duncan's Mills, California. This is the following poem. Quote, I've labored long and hard for bread, for honor and for riches. But on my corns too long you tread, you fine-haired sons of bitches. Black Bart, 1877. The second verse was left at the site of his July 25th, 1878 holdup of a stage traveling from Quincy to Oroville, California. And here it is, quote, Here I lay me down to sleep, to wait the coming morrow, perhaps success, perhaps defeat, and everlasting sorrow. Let come what will, I'll try it on. My condition can't be worse. And if there's money in that box, tis money in my purse. Black Bart, that's my favorite one. The other one was kind of funny because I said, you fine hair sons of bitches. Tis money in my purse sounds way cooler as an outlaw of the Wild West. I hope you really enjoyed this one. I didn't know about this outlaw. Uh, one of our listeners... Uh, sent this one uh, that I should be researching this one. So I hope you enjoyed this one and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks y'all.